remind you what papers you should have picked up or if you missed them. This one has the listing of readers and also an illustration of the cover of the latest book, Witness to Integrity, which is on sale at the back table. Also on sale at the back table is the place at the table. And if you go back, you can just in the pictures if you want to. It, it has the story of Immaculate Heart, Sisters Immaculate Heart Community, a retreat center, and besides that, there are recipes. So it's a cookbook, but it's also our story. So I urge you to invest in that. And in line with sales pitches, this is not plastic. I know most of us try to avoid plastic these days. But this is on sale at the back table also. And also on sale at the wonderful raffle table are raffle tickets. So buy $5, $10, $20, $40 worth. And if anybody wins the Navarro line, I'll, I'll scrape you. <laughs> We owe uh, a debt of gratitude to Alice Medina, who is the head librarian at this library. I'd like Alice to come forward and welcome to Alice. Welcome everyone to the East Los Angeles Library. I'm so glad to be here today. My name is Alice Medina. I am the library manager here. And I graduated from Queen of Angels in 68. Well, 68 graduates that are here today. We do have, I want to put a little plug in here for our friends of the library. We do have friends of the library. If any of you are interested in becoming friends of the library, we certainly welcome everyone. We do take uh, book donations as well. If you have any book donations that you'd like to you come into the community of East Los Angeles, you're welcome to donate them to the library. So, thank you for being here. Have a good day. And do enjoy our beautiful library. Yes. <laughs> I told Alice I have lots of books and textbooks at home. Probably most of us do. And so, this is a wonderful place to give our books and at home. This is the brochure of the Immaculate Heart Community, which is also at the back table. And I bought one of these bags when it was $15, now it's $10. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful bag, it's very substantial. So I think that's it for the sales. Um, if you haven't bought your raffle tickets, there will be time to buy these tickets. Why are we here today? It's a reunion of friends, teachers, four students, alumni of Queen of Angels. And several of us started teaching. I started teaching in 1952, and Carol was also at that time. We have been in touch with our former students over these, well, 50-something years with great affection. Um, I've gone to reunions. I really appreciate all the work. We really appreciate all the work that went into planning this event. Yes. Congratulate everybody who put this together. Yes. And the original concept of the program was to read excerpts from Anita's book because um, our story is a really interesting story. And the group that did the planning wanted to give you snapshots of what went on. We also urge you, however, to buy the book. And many of the details that are in the book, we were, I was unaware of. I was in New York in 65 at Columbia University. So many of us have memories, some good, some bad, 
of those times, and we can clue you in on to what the community is doing. So at this point, members of Immaculate Heart Community, would you please stand? administration of the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart of Mary of Los Angeles betrayed years of rage. It was May of 1965 when His Eminence James Francis McIntyre spoke those fateful words. Page 2. Since the close of the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, in 1965, our adoption of a spirit of renewal and openness to new theological ideas were a source of constant tension between the Cardinal and our religious community. His eminence was not comfortable with the direction in which the Second Vatican Council was moving. But on this particular May day, his dislike for the general updating of the church known as Aggiornamento, focused on the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart. Chapter 3, Background and Beginnings. Page 5. Sisters of the IHM were no strangers to change. Founded in Spain in 1848 in a semi-cloister form, the community had its mission at that time, religious instructions for the poor. Within 10 years, the sisters were offering a broader range of subjects in their orphanages and schools in seven major cities in Spain. Soon they were invited out of their small number to send sisters to the rough and tumble California of gold rush days. Ten Spanish sisters volunteered for Los Angeles in 1871 and by a series of misadventures landed in North, Northern California. Page 16. Bishop Mora had a major concern. In two letters to Mother Raimunda, he wrote that the sisters who were sent there to St. Viviana's would be academically well-equipped and 
Only the finest teachers of the community should be entrusted with important projects. The insistence on quality scholastic preparation from this very first assignment became an educational tradition for the community over the next six decades. strong administration of Mother Redenda Ward achieved financial stability for the California sisters, even during the difficult years of the Great Depression, with the cultural assimilation of the Spanish nuns into the American way of life and the security of financial viability, the sisters requested that Bishop John J. Cantwell petitioned the Vatican to establish an independent community in California. On November 29, 1922, the petition was sent to the Vatican. Approval was granted on April 18, 1924. <laughs> Chapter 6, The Sixties and the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart. The year 1963 was, without a doubt, a pivotal date in the history of the renewal of the Immaculate Heart Sisters. All this stirring of thought, combined with a new method of electing participants, made for both excitement and some apprehension regarding the outcome of the 1963 general chapter a meeting to adopt changes in the rule and the election of officers for the community. Then it happened. On the second ballot, the majority made me the new Mother General. That was Mother, that was Sister Anita. So we began to formulate a five-year plan for the renewal of the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart. This plan consumed much of our time and energy in the first year of our tenure. It was based on the principles identified by our own delegates to the 1963 chapter. But it was far less bold than the later document on religious life issued by the Second Vatican Council in 1963. Chapter 8. Now, so far, you have the founding of the community as daughters of the Immaculate Heart in Spain. And then in 1924, when the nuns said, we need to separate, we became sisters of the Immaculate Heart. And today we are Immaculate Heart community, so we've retained that devotion to our blessed mother. This is the archdiocesan visitation in Anita's voice. In early November 1965, the Immaculate Heart General Council decided it would be wise for those engaged in renewal to send a representative to Rome, where the Second Vatican Council was still in session. They chose me to go. It was exciting for me to attend the press conferences at which experts in church law theology or church history daily brief journalists of all ages and talents, while listeners, sisters, priests, and lay people gathered <coughs> eagerly. The richness of these occasions made me hopeful for the future of the IHMs. <coughs> but all too soon, the joy ended. A phone call came for me from the United States. Our Vicar General, Sister Elizabeth Ann Flynn, informed me that all was not well. She had been told by the Chancery Office that all the Immaculate Heart Sisters in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles were to have an official visitation from priests of the Archdiocese, and that according to the Vicar for Religious and Senior Edward Wade, ours was the only religious community 
to be visited in this manner. Once home with a sense of helplessness, I heard from the sisters of the humiliating interrogations by the visiting priests. The fear the sisters felt soon gave way to honest indignation. As each one faced questions designed, it would appear, to undermine their faith in the renewal process by questioning the present practices of the Immaculate Heart Sisters and many other matters mostly unrelated to the modest experimental changes proposed at the 1963 chapter. At this point, I'll give a brief reflection and the members at the table will be seated and the second shift will come forward. document on the subject of renewal for those living a religious life. In spite of some blurred distinctions, the document was clear on the basic issues of renewal. These were in brief. One, an orientation to scripture. Two, an orientation of liturgy. Three, an adaptation of the concept of authority as service. Four, a new understanding of the ecumenical movement. Five, a deepening awareness of contemporary life and our situation in it. Six, the development of a social conscious. Seven, abandonment of a narrow legalism in favor of the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But some sisters trained to think of themselves as removed from these problems through the security of prayer were peaceful and satisfied with their lives and did not want to hear about the realities now about to touch them personally. You have to remember this was in the 60s, right? As the meeting broke up, I met new hope and enthusiastic response in the eyes of most of the sisters. But I could already sense that there were small groups that were dismayed, disturbed, or openly opposed to the notion of a renewal of their lives. And uh, you have to remember also that <clears throat> I was one of the people that was sent to teach with just two years in the bishop. I didn't have any uh, credential or anything, so by the time that, this, that we had decided to do all this, I was on the list to go to college to get my, finish my education. And it was very hard. It was very hard. It wasn't easy because we had to also find uh, a place to live and support each other. And then also try to keep our prayer life going. So it, it was very difficult. In recalling a difficult period, Agnes Flint, sister Elizabeth Ann, interviewed on tape May 5th, 1988, spoke with great sadness the following. By the fall of 1965, I was made painfully aware that something had to give. 
We had too many sisters with our degrees and credentials, still trying to complete their education in what was informally, but not very joyfully, known as a 20-year plan. First, too many people in wrong assignments because there was no other way to spread the available people. Second, too many sisters trying to teach in the classrooms uh, 50 and 60. Third, too many young superiors and principals without adequate preparation of studies and experience. Fourth, too many sisters in need of psychological help because of the stressful situation in education. Fifth, too many who should not be teaching or in hospital work because their talents lay in other fields. Many should never have entered religious life, but some could possibly have accommodated it under other circumstances. Then, as was the case in religious communities across the nation, there was a steady flow of sisters applying for dispensations. I was asked to read a statement by Sister uh, Frances Snyder, Sister Hostia, if those of you can remember her. Dear Queen and Angels alums, I would very much like to be with you today for your discussion of witness to integrity. Certainly all our lives were gravely affected by the events described in this book. My memory goes back to the day I received a phone call from Monsignor Donald Montrose, who was the superintendent of secondary schools at the time. His brief and emotionless message was, quote, the decision has been made. Your school will be closed, unquote. This message was so traumatic that even so many years later, I can still remember where I was standing when I got this message and my sorrow at hearing this unexpected message. The results of this message you all know, and some of your lives were directly affected. For me, what followed was a large number of questions which had to be answered, and answered very soon. How do you close a high school? Where do the underclass women go for enrollment in other schools? What about the staff? Could we help them find jobs? And what about the Immaculate Heart Community Sisters? What does the future hold for them? How will we communicate with the parents of these students? What do we do with the records? How do we heal all the hearts that were broken by this action? Much has been written and spoken about the actions of the IHF community members. Some got jobs. I went to work as a teacher at Roosevelt High School. Some went back to school to finish degrees. Some left the community. But the story of, this, of the students needs to be told. This decision brought much sorrow as the girls sought enrollment in other high schools. These sufferings have been shared many times at meetings of alumni and in other gatherings. But much, I am, I am afraid, has, not, has been left untold. Maybe today is the time for such sharing. Our Lady Queen of the Angels High School was a very special place. And I am proud of her alumni who have gone on after these difficult experiences to continue what they learned at this school. Our alumni have built strong and loving families and accomplished much in their careers. Every time I meet an alumna, I experience bonds of love and pride in the lessons of this wonderful school. Blessings to you all. Love, Francis. My personal reflection and history.
history includes the double blessing of being former student of Queen of Angels and uh, from 1950 to 1956 and a former member of the Immaculate Heart community. Both groups have kept me energized with supportive friendships. The Queen of Angels alumni, men and women, from grammar school, I had one of my eighth grade classmates who is sitting right here today, Abhi Adanto, teach me to live the faith with generosity and hope. My Immaculate Heart sisters continue to inspire courage of being an unrelenting, loving witness of, for the amazing, wonderful diversity of God's people. And today I'm reading chapter 10. Embracing the vision, page 116. When the last paragraphs of the decrees were read to the sisters, those of us who were chapter delegates were deeply moved and pleased by the standing ovation our work received. Joyously and spontaneously, the entire assembly broke into a resounding, My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Joyful reception. If you haven't turned off your cell phone, I put it on vibrate. We appreciate you doing so now. Chapter 11 The Cardinal's Response to Renewal. The Cardinal stated firmly and very loudly that he would not have any IHM sisters in archdiocese schools without religious habits. I could not believe that after decades of serving the Catholic Church of Los Angeles, we were being fired over the issue of women's clothing. Very well, you can keep all your experiments and your fine decrees, but I tell you this, you won't be staying in my schools. And with that, he turned to Bishop Manning next to him, and he waved his arm in our direction. This is a continuation of the Cardinal's response to renewal. I have to say a little aside. I recently had cataract surgery, which works very well, except I can't tell whether to wear glasses or not. <laughs> <laughs> the aging process. What the Cardinal failed to realize was that the collective IHM reputation, the strength of character of each sister, and a deep faith that we were following the spirit of God through renewal would provide the solid foundation to meet this challenge. In the years since that time, many of our sisters not only found decent jobs, but were aggressively sought out by employers. We gathered our resources not only to sustain ourselves, but also to assist those in need. In this respect, the Cardinal surely underestimated the IHM women. Another page. The deadline of the end of the school year, June 1968, would soon be upon them. There were records and files to be put in order, convents to be inventoried, work for the coming year to be found, apartments and rental houses to be located. 
There were pastors to deal with and parents to be given endless explanation. And Francis certainly um, addressed that. Another page. In some other dioceses in California and in Canada, however, many of the sisters continued to teach in Catholic schools. But under the rubrics of the new chapter decrees, including a more flexible horarium and secular dress. Those sisters who had been teaching at schools owned and staffed by the IHM sisters, such as Immaculate Heart High School and College, also continued their apostolate under the new chapter decrees. But for the many members of the community, who had to vacate their school at the end of the 1967-68 school year, the transitional period was hectic. Now some of us were asked to give a brief personal reflection. I think mine is too long. But um, I was actually in that period of 1967-68 in a different situation from uh, many of the sisters who had to leave the schools. I had been at a motherhood council for seven years, and uh, while we were there, we felt so hopeful. Even when the interrogators came, we thought, they're going to understand that we're following the back and wishes, and uh, we just were thinking that it's all going to go forward very well. So at the end of my seven years, I went to Anita and I said, I think I've done what I can do here. And I've got a very good vice principal, Maria, and so um, she could take over as principal, which she did. Had I known what was going to befall the next year, I never would have taken that step. But Anita sent me to graduate school at UCSB Religious Studies and that was a great blessing for me. So I returned to our novitiate in Montecito and uh, lived there, went to uh, study at UCSB and worked at La Casa to earn my board and key. And so um, those years of 67 to 69 were very um, fruitful, growthful for me. And interestingly enough, my main professor, Dr. Walter Capps, uh, wrote at this time about process theology and the school of hope. So I just went along with the school of hope. And um, eventually it did turn out well. And I came back to La Casa. And, um, but I did feel for Maria and for Francis and all the people who had to close the schools. This is page 204. The board approved my idea of a community assembly, the presentation of all our alternatives, and allowing each sister to vote for her own choice. And so we announced a meeting of all IHM community members for December the 6th of 1969. At this meeting, I announced my personal decision and asked each sister to make her own decision, understanding that belonging to the group in accord with the new chapter meant that she had to obtain a dispensation from her vows and would lose her canonical status. I spoke from my heart to each sister. Uh, they gave me a name, but it didn't be a place at the table, so maybe I need to buy that book back. This is the place at the table. I remember the first sister. Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong page. Do 
the end of 1969, but before the sisters' final choices had been presented to our community, the major superiors of communities of both men and women in the United States began to protest to the Vatican the threat and interference in the lives of the American religious, and in particular, the treatment of the Anabahar Sisters Renewal Program. The two largest organizations, the Conference of Major Superiors of Men and the Conference of Major Superiors of Women, each presented to their members formal letters and resolutions for approval, and in both organizations, an overwhelming majority endorsed these efforts. In the case of the Conference of Major Superiors of Men, Father Paul M. Boyle, he was a president of the conference, has circulated a formal letter addressed to Carol Antonini of the Sacred Congregation for Religious and approved in his first draft by two-thirds vote of the major superiors. After suggested changes were made, a second draft was approved by 73% of the members and was sent to the Cardinal. In his letter on November 6, 1969, Father Boyle indicated the deep disappointment of the superiors at the position taken by the Sacred Congregation in his letter of February the 21st, 1968 in the unfortunate controversy surrounding the IHM Sisters of Los Angeles, California, the letter of the Sacred Congregation uh, wrote, uh, indicative of an attitude contrary to the spirit, if not the letter of the conciliar and post-conciliar documents, especially in those sections of the Moda Propria Ecclesia Sante. This was the one that told us to make the changes. And what he's saying is that we're going, they were going against us which states that the most important role in the adaptation and renewal of religious life belongs to the institutes themselves, and that general chapters have the right to, after certain, to alter certain norms of their constitutions as long as the purpose, nature, and character of the institutes are preserved. It is hard for our religious to accept that the Congregation for Religious can appreciate the situation better than the responsible religious of the country in which they live. Chapters, major superiors, and thousands of religious in many communities across the country are doing one of several of the things reprobated by the Congregation for Religious in the letter of mentioned above. The second part of the reading is from 213. I remember the first sister who came into my office with her signed acceptance for a dispensation. She was over 70 and was still wearing her entire habit without modification of any kind. And she wore it to the day of her death years later. Documents show that she had made her vows before I was born. And I marveled at her serenity as she handed me the official forms. Then I read her note appended to the application for dispensation. I have signed this, but just after I did, I went into the chapel and renewed my promises to God. I marveled at Sister Anna Mosanti's faith, the smile to myself, and the simplicity that triumphed the triumph in that single line of hers. Although the sister, and no doubt others as well, were not in complete agreement with some of the decisions of the chapter of renewal, no legal status could interfere with their lifetime commitment to God, to the community that they had joined. That this community had made lawful decisions seemed clear to them. For her and for many sisters, the commitment was different in form, but not in change in depth. Call it that what you will was the means by which they would continue to serve God. Eventually, our group, which identified with the changes approved by the chapter renewal, took it as legal title, Immaculate Heart Community, a title recorded by the State of California on October 1st, 1970, and wrote a contract that would cons constitute our commitment to the Immaculate Heart Community. Did I be a lovely? Oh, I did. I'm sorry. I, I was wondering why that was there. Okay, I'll stop. I, all I want to make with one comment, two comments actually. In this little paper here, it says, you know, it has grammar school and high school, or elementary school. I just want to say, I was in both places. I think I came to our Lady of Angels for the first time in 1960 and taught seventh grade in, in the grammar school. Then I came back in 67 and taught at the high school. So I just want to make sure that it's clear I was there twice. And, I <laughs> and, 
And I was also there at the very the year that we closed. So all, I'm just so glad that you are reading this because it was so hard to uh, help the students to understand what was going on. And we couldn't say very much. You know, some of our hands were tied, or our thumbs were tied. <laughs> So that's why I said I'm sorry. All that's enough. You can read it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will skip what I'm telling you. So I'll go forward. Um, chapter 14, A New Life for Religious Women. Since no mention of the term Roman Catholic was made in the contract, the delegates of the IHM chapter also moved to open its doors for the first time to Christians of all denominations, not solely Roman Catholics. By a letter to us from Archbishop Manning announcing that a non-canonical community could no longer have a chapel or reserve the Blessed Sacrament in the Mother House Chapel, the Infirmary Chapel and the College Chapel were not missing from this board. Um, this is from chapter 15. As a Christian ecumenical community, our rituals are open and not confined by male privileged rules and prohibitions. We are free to serve in the public and private realms of life. As attorneys, educators, ministers, professors, nurses, mothers and fathers, social workers, foster mothers, scholars, musicians, secretaries, retreat and shelter directors, we continue to expand our understanding of being a Christian in the world. We are free to love and form committed relationships that enhance and serve the world. And then on page 220, it was not a single who forced us to abandon canonical status in the Catholic Church. The vast ecclesiastical system for centuries has used every ploy to keep women beholden to its curiously antedated rules and regulations. Bishops, cardinals, and priests have inherited the legacy of dominion over women, especially over women religious who, by their built-in dependencies of their lifestyles, were made subservient to male clerics. And on page 221. Out of this experience of disempowerment was to come empowerment. Out of predicted demise, there was to come unexpected life and growth. Out of an unjust condemnation of our renewal was to come a renewed commitment to the works of justice. I was really glad that I got to read that last paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> We stand here, and with you are very faithful, very, very faithful friends 40 years later um, as a living legacy to what the women of that time um, knew the Spirit was calling them to. Nobody knew what, what was to happen. Anita did not set out to form this particular situation, but when she found herself on the process, led by the Spirit, there was no way to do otherwise. Uh, I am an anomaly in standing here in front of you because in 1970, I had been in the community for 10 years and loved it dearly. And I left with the many people in 1970 because I really did not understand what was to come and what, um, how things were to develop. But I kept in touch, like you do, with all these wonderful people and the women who have formed me. And those friendships were so important in my life that in 1993, 
when someone said to me, you know, you can be a member. And I said, yeah, I guess I can. And so I talked to my husband, who knew I was in the Immaculate Heart anyway, because that was part of my life. Um, my children really didn't understand, and they still don't today understand what this is. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, they're boys. It's okay. <laughs> um, but I came back, and I've been back 15 years later, and I think what is particularly interesting in the light of the last a paragraph is currently I am serving as a director of the community with another woman who has been in about 22 years and she happens to be a Lutheran. So we are currently the co-directors of an ecumenical community, a Christian community, and for the first time in that sense living this out together. Both of us are mothers and grandmothers and very, very appreciative of the opportunity to be in the situation where you're in. I'm really especially honored today, too, to be here and to let you know that we are growing and growing. We have six new members, two of whom are here with us today. So our brand new members, Aida's way back in the back, stand up and wave, and Pat Cosman, who is here with us. We are very, very proud of the growth and the wonderful people that are being called, possibly even some of the people that are members. <laughs> and, um, I don't know who's to follow here. Are you uh, Lenore? I'm the last reading. I'm the last reading. <laughs> and uh, Pat is an ordained Baptist minister. So we are very blessed and very enriched by um, members who have come. And we invite all of you to join in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are we on time? For you? We have ten minutes of questions and answers. You heard the boss. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if there are any questions, would you? We have a microphone unless you can stick out, and any member of the community um, is available to answer. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, for those of us who are not part of this, I'm still not really clear as to what renewal was and what the real issue was that caused it. It sounds like it was about the U.S. I mean, are they really Catholic or it, For some, it sounded as if the habit was the main issue. But as some of us pointed out in the reading did show, one of the primary goals was to educate all of us. At that time, we were only teachers. Presently, in the Immaculate Heart community, we have a variety of professions. Some of us have continued to teach. That's all we know how to do. Um, but other um, things that came along with renewal would be to be in the world, to serve wherever we felt called. So some of our members uh, went to law school, served as lawyers. Some went to the training in uh, social service. So. At that time, in order to get retrained, re-educated, uh, we couldn't continue to live a common life. Couldn't continue to wake up and have meditation and wine and mass together. So the routine changed because the ministry changed. And the call to be of service to a broader community meant changing our lifestyle, so, which got translated into the habit. And the, the clothing was only a a small, minor part and a function of being part of the world that we wanted to serve. Who we'll asked the question? Uh, are you aware that there was a, before it all started, that there was something that came out from the fact that that was the part that I read, the more appropriate one? And that one came out from the Vatican, from, from Vatican II actually, but then later on. And the thing was that every single community in the world, both men and women, were asked to look at their congregations and to ask certain questions. First of all, why were they founded? You know, what was the work that were, they were called to do? And then, if they were going to be uh, founded today, which was at that time, you know, what would be the answer? And that's what happened to the community. We started looking at those questions, and that's where all these renewal things came from, because we were in a different tradition. That when she was talking about the, 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 the prayer schedule, we were on a monastic prayer schedule. And, but we were in schools, you know, we had after school things with the children and everything else. So that's where the changes came. 
And that's what we were doing. We were following the first moon profile, which came from the Valentine. Okay. Um, and, and the problem was that in following it, you know, the, the, the sisters followed what the Vatican was saying quite joyfully, but it was contrary to what the Cardinal really envisioned as proper for religious communities. And although the Vatican could say to everyone, this is what we need to do as a church, the Cardinal could say who taught in his schools and who lived in his convents. So it was, you can do that, but you may not teach in my schools or live in my convents unless you do as I say. Another question or another answer? I'm a member of class of 67, and uh, I I know we were innocent and we didn't know too much about politics, and they called they figured that we were children, we wouldn't understand, but I felt that. I still don't understand why our teachers are um, from 63 to 67 did not tell um, the students as a whole what was really going on. I remember vaguely that certain issues were brought to our attention, but we were not really told the entire concept. The other Part of my question is after we graduated, or I graduated in 67, and the last graduating class was 68, when the killer for me was when they sold our school, and most of the alumni, had you not, if they were not around the neighborhood, they wouldn't know what was going on, even though the community knew where to find most of us. That's my, where, I lost my um, my faith in communication because we were not notified at our school. I found out after the fact through some law enforcement officers because I worked law enforcement at the time. So, what happened? Is there anybody here who was at the honor? I wasn't there, but as, uh, I'm the archivist of our community, and as Anita Daniels mentioned that we were told not to say anything. We just couldn't say anything. It would affect, it would affect the students. It would affect our parents. Well, my sister was to be in the class of 69. She was so disappointed and heartbroken. She could not finish at Queen of Angels as my sister Martha and me. Rosa Marriquez was in the same class. She just could not finish that year. So she was told, and many of the girls at that time were not allowed to go to the schools that they wanted to. They were not given an explanation. Oh, you're from Queen of Angels, and you cannot come to our school. I think that's basically what took place. We were denied where we wanted to go to school, the Catholic schools. And the second thing was, I forgot your second question, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, the, the sound of the school, that was not our doing. Once it was closed, um, I think part of the grammar school, Our Lady of Laredo School students came to use the grammar school for a while, but the high school was closed. Everything was auctioned off, as I recall. And by law, nothing is, nothing has to be kept by the archivist of the Los Angeles uh, Archdiocese except for the, your school records. So if you want your school records, you contact the Diocese of Los Angeles. And so be, that being not our property, we had no say as to what was going to happen. And at that time, the Cardinal needed, I, I, I'm assuming and I'm reading into this, he needed money to pay the lay teachers because a lot of us got $50 a month. The, teach, the nuns got $50 a month, if that much. And that is why uh, he had to find means of paying for his lay teachers if he could not replace us by uh, sisters. So uh, that, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, we were not able to say much. I happened to be teaching in Palm Springs at the time. So 
So I was not as affected as those that were teaching in Los Angeles. But the fact that even even our parents looked at us very, very with with an under, not understanding what was happening. Why are you going to take your habit off? I mean, if you're not a sister anymore. And I said to them, I hope you see me as an individual, not as a religious walking in a habit. And they used to see it me as the church representative, not as me, Anna Maria. Thank you. Rosa? The, I would have graduated in 1970, and our parents were called to a meeting by the Archdiocese of LA. And they were promised that the school was not going to close because we were so afraid that it was going to close. They promised we were not going to close. And technically they didn't. We were incorporated with Bishop Kennedy. And so all of us were told to go to Bishop Kennedy. And those of us that said we did not want to go to Bishop Kennedy, and it was a good school, but we didn't want to be told where to go. We were told at school after school after school, you are not accepted here. They had, and we found out afterwards they had a quota. And there were only certain schools that we were accepted, and we found out afterwards why. Because they were very, very conservative schools. Mass is still in Latin, the priest back to the girls. And as far as, and it still hurts to go by there and see a parking lot. And it has to do with power, because you don't see that at Cathedral High School, because they were going to sell Cathedral. But people got together and heard about it, and the Archdiocese relented. But it's still happening in other places, too. There's a lot of schools, especially in the barrios, in the poor parts of town, that are being shut down. And those young people are not being given the opportunity of a good, private, Catholic education. Thank you, Rosa. We're grateful, though, that Queen of Angels lives on not in a building, but in a home. And those of you who still are so loyal to the school, so thank you for your spirit and for your presence. Is time up? Two minutes. Um, two minutes. Two minutes. Well, Irma, Irma's going to sell you uh, $10 or $10. <laughs> <laughs> and first, um, My mother was taught by Sister Benigna. Oh. <laughs> in Tucson, Arizona. And my mother met up with her at the Placita. And she got my sister and I into, into the school. So I, IHM goes a lot. I mean, it's in my family. But I want, as I told this sister, I don't remember her name. I know she taught somewhere in Burbank. But I talked to her and I was telling her this, that all you IHMs need to know that you gave a part of yourself to every student that's, that came, you came across to. And you need to know that we carried that back to our families and to everybody we touched. And they were influenced. They were, and we have to wait till we get to the other side to know all the good works you've done, but I can tell you a lot of roots in my own family. I have four adult children who are madly in love with Jesus, and that, that, that says a lot. 
Okay, and um, okay, this is my twitches. Well, I'm the other side. <laughs> what I got from IHM is being a rebel. <laughs> and a rebel with a cause. I always was righteous. And I worked 27 years in, in, uh, at USC, and they knew me as the mercy department. So IHM, you did. Yeah, and you did it, and you're continuing to do it. And I'm going to look into the community now. <laughs> you are invited to buy um, Nate's book, and they are signed, to buy travel tickets, to have refreshments, and to greet one another. And Anybody? Oh, one last announcement. On August 22nd in Montecito, we are celebrating 40 years of the founding of the Macula Park Union, 1978 to 2010. So if you want more information, you can ask any of us, and we will, there are forms to go out. We invite you. Thank you for coming.